Largely forgotten in contemporary political discourse, even among classicists, is the inextricable link between democracy and sea power. Ancient Greek communities emerged from federations of household cults, cults primarily concerned with the integrity of the family's property. A passage from the 19th century French anthropologist Numa Denise Fustel de Coulanges' once widely known study, La Cité Antique, The Ancient City, is worth quoting at length. Quote, the nations of Greece and Italy from the earliest antiquity always held to the idea of private property. We do not find an age when the soil was common among them, nor do we find anything that resembles the annual allotment of land which was in vogue among the Germans. And here we note a remarkable fact. While the races that do not accord to the individual a property in the soil allow him at least a right to the fruits of his labor, that is to say, to his harvest, precisely the contrary custom prevailed among the Greeks. In many cities, the citizens were required to store their crops in common, or at least the greater part, and to consume them in common. The individual, therefore, was not the master of the corn which he had gathered, but at the same time, by a singular contradiction, he had an absolute property in the soil. To him, the land was more than the harvest. It appears that among the Greeks, the conception of private property was developed exactly contrary to what appears to be the natural order. It was not applied to the harvest first and to the soil afterwards, but followed the inverse order. There are three things which from the most ancient times we find founded and solidly established in these Greek and Italian societies. The domestic religion, the family, and the right of property. Three things which had in the beginning a manifest relation and which appear to have been inseparable. The idea of private property existed in the religion itself. Every family had its hearth and its ancestors. These gods could be adored only by this family, and protected it alone. They were its property. Now between these gods and the soil, men of the early ages saw a mysterious relation. Let us first take the hearth. This altar is the symbol of a sedentary life. Its name indicates this. It must be placed upon the ground. Once established, it cannot be moved. The god of the family wishes to have a fixed abode. Materially, it is difficult to transport the stone on which he shines. Religiously, this is more difficult still, and is permitted to a man only when hard necessity presses him, when an enemy is pursuing him, or when the soil cannot support him. When they establish the hearth, it is with the thought and hope that it will always remain in the same spot. The god is installed there not for a day, not for the life of one man merely, but for as long a time as this family shall endure, and there remains any one to support its fire by sacrifices. Thus, the sacred fire takes possession of the soil and makes it its own. It is the god's property. And the family, which through duty and religion remains grouped around its altar, is as much fixed to the soil as the altar itself. The idea of domicile follows naturally. The family is attached to the altar, the altar is attached to the soil. An intimate relation, therefore, is established between the soil and the family. There must be his permanent home, which he will not dream of quitting unless an unforeseen necessity constrains him to it. Like the hearth, it will always occupy this spot. This spot belongs to it, is its property, the property not simply of a man, but of a family, whose different members must, one after another, be born and die here." Unquote. As a further testament to how central property was to ancient Greek communities, consider that the word nomos, which we today frequently mistranslate as law, owing to a conflation between nomos and the Latin word lex introduced in the first century BC by the Roman statesman Cicero, is derived literally from the Greek verb nemine, which meant to section off land for agricultural use or pasture, and formed the whole basis for comparing different community forms in ancient Greek thought. As Heraclitus of Ephesus is recorded to have written, quote, Those who speak with knowledge must rely firmly on what is common to all, as a city relies on its nomos. Finally, the word politics itself, which is taken to demarcate all thought concerned with human community, derives from the word polis, which in its oldest sense refers to the walled fortress at the community's center. Hence, on the mountain in the middle of Athens sits the Acropolis, literally the fortress on the height, which was simultaneously castle and temple. As a religious community federating many smaller religious communities, the ancient polis was deeply exclusive. 
citizens were such by inheriting the right to the assembly from their fathers by religious right. And far from blood and soil nationalism, the status of sons could be revoked at will by the patriarch. Blood mattered insofar as only sons could inherit citizenship, but it was only by religious sanction that sons were made sons. We're going to see now how democracy killed this state of affairs. At the tail end of the Persian War, after Athens was liberated from Persian occupation, the Athenian general and politician Themistocles, importantly not an aristocrat, convinced the Athenians to construct a great navy of 200 triremes, a Phoenician design of ship intended solely for combat. Initially, this was meant to defeat the Persian allied city of Aegina, for which they were ultimately not used, but then, more importantly later, this fleet was expanded a little bit more to fight the Persians themselves at sea. Themistocles understood that the massive Persian foot army relied upon ships to supply it on the march, making the army and the navy effectively a single unit. If one defeated the Persians at sea, one defeated them on land. Thus, the Athenian turning to the sea as its primary domain was also a tacit admission of weakness as much as a strategic move. Athens couldn't compete on land with any power greater than Sparta, but on the ocean, where guile, strategy, and technical skill would have a greater impact than raw numbers, it could turn the tide. The Persians were lured into the Strait of Salamis, where their great numbers hindered maneuver, ultimately suffering a horrendous defeat and putting the Persian forces on the defensive for the remainder of the war. Triremes were critical here because, historically, when ancient cities required ships, these would be open galleys donated by wealthy citizens who otherwise used them for private commercial ends trade, fishing, etc. These more utilitarian vessels, often single-deck longships called pentaconters, functioned as effectively portable islands. With archers shooting at distance until their vessel was directly alongside that of the enemy to allow a contingent of hoplites to fight the crew of the opposing ship just as if they were fighting on solid ground. This means that larger numbers still tended to prevail over smaller ones just like on land. Triremes, on the other hand, had no economic value at all. They were built to maximize speed, and that meant minimizing weight. There is no excess room aboard a trireme for cargo. Rowers are shoulder to shoulder. Every man has a station, and every station a man. The front of the ship was beaked with metal, the ship itself being a ramming weapon, and in conjunction with its large size, a trireme also required a trained crew of experts who could sharply maneuver the vessel under highly stressful and chaotic conditions. Victory in trireme combat pivoted on maneuver, and Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War contains several accounts of trireme battles between smaller and larger forces being decided not by the numbers of the soldiers on deck, but by the skills of the sailors. On top of all this, triremes were extremely expensive to maintain, requiring large dedicated harbors and a large labor force dedicated to their upkeep, as well as ongoing training for their crews during peacetime. What you are looking at here is the famous circular port at Carthage, another sea power of the ancient world. In effect, Athens had a standing navy before it had a standing army. These qualities of the trireme had three upshots. First, only the state could afford to equip, crew, and maintain a trireme fleet. Gone were the days when elites would donate them at will. Second, due to the state requiring enormous funds to maintain a fleet of triremes among the Greek states, which were far smaller than great land powers like the Persian Empire, only oligarchic republics that privileged the wealthy and their role in trade could become great powers through their trireme fleets. And third, due to the expert labor required for these ships to be effective, a large population of professional sailors and rowers had to be maintained even in peacetime, and with this new importance came greater clout with respect to political demands made by this class. Inclusive politics are thus found to be a condition also of maintaining a trireme fleet. These conditions had to be met through deliberate efforts. Thucydides records a remark made by Syracusian generals made on the eve of its decisive defeat of Athens near the end of the disastrous Sicilian campaign. That Athens wasn't born a sea power like they were, descendants as they were of the sea-reliant Corinthians, but only became such out of fear of the Persians. This point is critical to grasp, that Athenian sea power did not emerge organically, but was a conscious choice requiring strenuous effort. Being the best kind of warship available, only cities that could deploy triremes could effectively project power at sea, 
Being extremely expensive, only cities that could afford to build, staff, and maintain triremes could have trireme fleets, obviously. To be able to afford to build, staff, and maintain triremes, the city had to be able to secure money and materials, and this meant enticing not just nobles, but also wealthy merchants, tradesmen, oarsmen, sailors, boatswains, etc. And what Athens had to offer these in exchange for their money and their labor were citizens' rights at the heart of a growing maritime empire. Contrary to the popular cliché that Athens' unique inclusivity and democratic ideals were the result of her proximity to the ocean and its role as a trade hub, it was precisely democracy and inclusivity which allowed it to rule by sea as a conscious choice in order to counter its inadequacy on land. Democracy was a technological condition of sea power. Athens wasn't democratic because it ruled by the sea. Athens was able to rule by the sea because it was democratic. You might be aware of a thesis by Graham Allison called Thucydides' Trap, which attempts to explain the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War in terms of Athens' growing military strength. The idea being that the Spartans were afraid of Athens' material power, and so tried to meet them in battle before they became unstoppable. This couldn't be farther from the truth. Sparta feared Athens' growing greatness, not its military strength, because it was self-consciously sourced in its democratic ideals and this encouraged communities to become like Athens and abstract themselves away from their land and thence, quite literally, the legitimizing ground of their traditional religiously ordained aristocratic rulers. This is why the Spartans objected to the building of the long walls of Athens to the Piraeus. This allowed the people of Athens to flee to the port of Piraeus in time of attack and function as a de facto island, and this uprootedness of the Athenians this self-insularity of their political identity was far more than a mere strategic decision. When the Athenian army on Sicilian expedition was stranded and on the retreat, the general Nicias tried to uphold morale by telling his men that they themselves were the city, that they were Athens, and that they wouldn't be dying and fighting in an alien land in truth. The city of Athens thus became not just a community, but a state of mind, and this was cultivated deliberately through the same offices that administrated the acquisition of ships, soliciting art and poetry, a massive propaganda effort, to cement in the minds of Athenians, mostly the up-and-coming classes of merchants and sailors rather than the landed nobility who were still oriented more to the tomb cults of their ancestors, that Athens was not of the land, but of herself, and could exist wherever her will took her whether to distant lands or on the formless, ever-changing sea. When Aristotle later identified the polis not with its walls, but with its citizens, it was in continuation with this move toward an abstraction of politics from the city, an abstraction of politics from the polis itself. This was much to the consternation of traditional elites and those who valued aristocratic prudence, including Thucydides and Plato, who observed that recklessness grew in proportion to the ruling party's distance from terrestrial interests. And indeed, this recklessness did lead to disaster for Athens, which was led more by ambition and daring than by caution and received wisdom. As the anonymous Athenian writer dubbed by classicists the old oligarch observed in a text called The Constitution of the Athenians, once apocryphally attributed to Xenophon, quote, it is right that the poor and the ordinary people there should have more power than the noble and the rich, because it is the ordinary people who man the fleet and bring the city her power. They provide the helmsmen, the boatswains, the junior officers, the lookouts, and the shipwrights. It is these people who make the city powerful much more than the hoplites and the noble and respectable citizens." Unquote. And later, quote, Throughout the world, the aristocracy are opposed to democracy for they are naturally least liable to loss of self-control and injustice, and most meticulous in their regard for what is respectable, whereas the masses display extreme ignorance, indiscipline, and wickedness. For poverty gives them a tendency towards the ennoble, and in some cases a lack of money leads to their being uneducated and ignorant." Unquote. Democracy was understood as a temptation brought on by the sea, and thus in his dialogue The Laws, or in Greek, nomoi, Plato proposed that it is best for the city to be without sight of the water. Of course, it must be said that absent the seaborne democracy of Athens, 
such critics as Plato would not even exist. There is a reason Sparta produced no philosophers, and without the famed openness and ingenuity of Athens, there would never have been a Plato, student of a convicted atheist, to write of incorporeal forms which could survive the endless flux of the material sea of matter. The point, however, was that the poor, the enslaved, and the unlanded had much less to lose in the actual soil of the polis, and this allowed them to imagine the community out of that soil, out of the cults of ancestral graves and demon-haunted hedges, into the purely optional community form of the sea state, and to project their interests far away from their holdings in the polis, even to the extent that they considered the polis itself expendable. And it must be said that this is genuinely dangerous. This made them flexible and innovative, but also reckless. This move is critical for understanding the role of democracy in the history of the modern world as one of the key turning points toward the abstract, deterrestrialized politics that defines all politics really after Machiavelli. Thomas Hobbes, probably the most important canonical political philosopher of the modern state, did not entitle his major book, which attributed all political community to impressions and agreements, the Leviathan for nothing. Our thought today is thoroughly infested with the idea that our political identity is entirely divorced from the land from which it sprang. And to be honest, I don't see this as necessarily a bad thing, because on the one hand, I don't consider mud worthy of our worship. But on the other hand, it bears remembering that we didn't arrive here by some natural accruement of scale or by smarts. A long time ago, some few people made a daring choice and separated themselves forever from the comforting vagueness of community forms inherited from our prehistory or inherent in biology. And this choice has had consequences. Not all of them good. Because no longer oriented to religion, to land, to the concrete, we can find our identity in virtually anything. In an idea, in an object, in a recently created or even a not yet created community form, in an imagined community of those possessing common genetic or intellectual traits. Democracy freed us from the concrete, which was to be sure a cruel master, but it set us adrift in a sea of uncertainties where only will has any solidity. I am reminded of a quote from my favorite chapter of Moby Dick called The Blanket. Quote, O man, admire and model thyself after the whale. Do thou too remain warm among ice. Do thou too live in this world without being of it. Be cool at the equator. Keep thy blood fluid at the pole. Like the great dome of St. Peter's and like the great whale, retain, O man, in all seasons a temperature of thine own. Unquote. As always, thank you for listening, and do take care.